Ik dan in één woord. Creatief. Super enthousiast. Technology. Digitize. Zo so wat innovation. Collaboration. Fun. <laughs> Startup. Creativity. Tiring. Innovation. Research. To discover. Teamwork. Cool. Experience. Pure fun. Challenge. Teamwork. Cool. Genius. Team. Synergy. Smart. Fun. Inspirating. Enthusiasm. Hot. It's really cool to be here the second time as a facilitator of the second hackathon in construction in Belgium. We do this um, for smart buildings, for smart cities today and with 80 participants from all over the industry with people from uh, technical and digital expertise, people from the construction industry, people from business. We all together, we brainstormed, we had 18 ideas on Friday, we selected the seven best ideas and now on Sunday we presented the coolest projects that will really change our industry. We are here for innovation, for co-creation, for creativity, but also to learn about how uh, working together and this open collaboration format can really change the industry. And so that's why we launched this hackathon to have a vibe throughout the industry and uh, in Belgium and abroad, because we have like more than nine nationalities over here. Um, so this is, I think, an amazing experience, at least for me it was, as a facilitator to see all these teams grow. And I hope also for the participants, they enjoyed, they learned, they co-created, they innovated, and they make something happen. If not with the project they have started during this hackathon, then with other projects later on, which we also uh, gave them and teach them about the tools they can use to make real innovation happen. Here we are at the second edition of Hackathon of Construction from 11 October to 13. We are here at Smart Hackathon, Smart Building for Smart Cities. I organized this hackathon with the help of uh, my colleagues from Confederation Construction, B6, uh, BBR Ride, Innoviris and uh, Kronos Group. Thanks to um, Willemann Group and Buffel, they are here too. So thanks to, to our sponsor, uh, I will uh, thanks uh, again uh, AAJ and uh, Boston to uh, provide uh, uh, support for the organization. So I'm very glad uh, for all ID prototype uh, all during the weekend. Uh, congratulations to all the winners. I hope uh, their project will, will be uh, in development soon. Uh, thanks to our sponsor again. Um, we are waiting for you for the next edition. Uh, we don't know yet the team, but I'm sure you want to be here next time. Innoviris is a public funding agency in Brussels that has a mission uh, to fund the innovative projects uh, realized by uh, Brussels-based companies. So I'm innovation facilitator at Innoviris, what means that I'm the contact person uh, in order to get uh, as much information as possible about our funding programs. So if we are here today, if I'm here today, it's because uh, I want to represent Innoviris and explain to uh, the future entrepreneurs what we can do for them, but also to participate as a coach in order to be able to inject some uh, content and advices uh, that we can do in innovation aspects of the projects. BBRI is very happy to be part of this second edition of the hackathon. For us, we promote as a research institute innovation, but this hackathon enables us to go a step further, to do open innovation. And the advantage for us is that the construction companies here that are present, well, they meet other companies from completely different industries and they will have uh, yeah, the opportunity to, see, to get new insights which enables us to push them further and, and promote another way of innovating. And that's what we will present today. These teams are a little bit nervous, that's like normal, so uh, we will not spoil too much time, but for the ones that are new, like the jury members, this is the Wi-Fi code. For the ones that are not so new and for the jury members, you can share pictures, videos, Facebook, likes, whatever, everything. Share with a smart hack hashtag, because we are really proud to be here at the second edition of the Belgian Construction Hackathon. And we think that is really important that we shared it with the world. So that everyone in this world knows that in Belgium, construction industry is like not lagging behind, like it sometimes is in other countries, but we are really going for things like hackathons, open innovation, creativity, collaboration, 
etc. for 48 hours. For the jury members, you might see teams that are a bit tired, they look tired, they probably are. That's normal, they worked very hard to come up with the presentations we have. We will also thank our sponsors and partners, so Go Station uh, for, the, for the venue, Go Station also asks us not to sleep here during the night, but that's uh, something I still have from the Friday evening slides. Also, I'm a bit tired and I uh, uh, copied and pasted a bit. We thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, to start with, the people from the BBRI, sometimes also known as Le CSTC, VTCB, VTB. Huh? Where are you? Yahoo! Thank you very much. We have the Confederation of Construction. Uh, we have the people of P6. Where are you? Yahoo! We have the people of Colors Group. Where are you? Woo. All right. Innovaries. <laughs> Alone, but very uh, enthusiastic. very enthusiastic. So it goes for much. Uh, Buffel is gone, I think, but he really helped us a lot. I think I can uh, uh, I can speak for everyone uh, of the participants yesterday. Buffel is like a very cool online tool that helps us or helped us with customer validation. We have relevant EEG. Where are you? All right. Um, we have uh, Go Station again, and then EIT. Are they here? But they are still very cool. <laughs> I have Boston. I have Boston. Where is Boston? Somewhere. So we have a lot of partners. They helped us a lot to make this all possible. And that is what I'll be going to do now. We will present the five teams, uh, the seven teams. The seven teams will present in five minutes. We are very strict on the five minutes. After five minutes, we will just uh, push you off the stage. Uh, I, I'm here for, for Alicia and Basic. Uh, okay, that's also something I copied from, from Friday. Uh, but we try to help people in open innovation. Voilà. And this like the, 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 the main things you need for a cool and uh, uh, important and a nice concept. That is, you need to find something that people really want. Uh, there should be a real customer need. It should be something that is technologically feasible. And it should be something that is business-wise worth it. That's like the three main criteria for every good business idea. Then we also have sustainability, which we added as a fourth jury criterion because we really think that's extremely important to have like a uh, sustainable project. And the fifth one is we want to see also a score and you all will get a score on the way you presented the presentation. So that's like the five questions. The jury members here in front I will quickly uh, ask them to introduce themselves in like uh, 15 seconds in a minute so they can already start thinking. So that's like the five things they will answer. In the end, we also have a surprise. That is, you also have to watch out and, and, and look at all the presentations and try to uh, figure out for yourself which one you liked the most. Because it's also the uh, uh, vote of the public, vote of the audience. So also you will be asked to vote at the end. And we prefer you not to vote for your own project, because that would like just be a bit stupid, right? Uh, so you vote for one of the six others that you also really like, and then we put that together, and then we have like the public vote thing. All right. Without further ado, people ask me what is the order of the presentations. Actually, I also don't know. I just randomly put them in the presentation one after the other. But I have a push button. When I push the button, you will have the same first slide because we agreed on having the same first slide with the name of your team. If you see your team arise or the slide for your team arise, then you just come down. Uh, we prefer that like the, the speakers are here, the others can be a bit uh, around, hang around or sit here in front. For the questions part, you can also come up and then we have like a nice discussion. Meanwhile, I will also present you Kun. Kun is over there. Well, that's good. Hi, um, I'm Annelien and I work at Ransom, as you 
probably know, Ranson is a manufacturer of ventilation products and sun protection products. Um, at Ranson, we have uh, the following problem. Um, my colleague Sarah, she receives over 10,000 pages of specification sheets each year, each year, and she has to process them manually. So she has to um, find out if there are um, um, parts in the specification sheets where we can offer a Ranson product. And as you can all imagine, this is a time-consuming um, work and an unsatisfying job. So my dream is to have a robot doing um, the manual processing that she has today on an automated way. Hey, Amelie. That's uh, exactly where we have been working on with Consolingua this weekend. Consolingua is a trusted partner in the construction industry, which provides tailor-made solutions uh, in a standardized way by processing a lot of technical sheets and also summarizing. So, because we have um, always a thing that as a demo shows more than uh, a thousand slides, Thomas will present a demo how we yeah. can actually put value together. Thank you. So here we have a specification sheet that's about 250 pages long. And we can go through it and then we realize there's not even a table of contents. So this is a real specification sheet from Ransom that I um, received to check if there is a solution they can provide to solve this. And so if you go manually over it, it would take a, lo a large amount of time. And so we have built like a little application um, for even reaching sustainability, so we don't waste paper, we don't print that, uh, very much. So you can upload the PDF and submit the file to our server and now cross the fingers that the Wi-Fi works and the connection is there. And then we are calculating a result and hopefully show it. So at the left side, then you see from the 250 pages extracted the main points. And here the check marks indicate the service calculated that we at Ransom can do this and we can provide a solution for this. The is valid column is there that we can give feedback to the service was the prediction correct, so can we do it or not? So the service is learning every time and every time it is feed with new PDFs. Yeah, and so the solution uh, provided is the 411 ransom, um, and that is like a wall ventilator. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's clear that we can provide some value for Amelie, but you might wonder is there any other clients out there we can serve? And actually, there is. Um, Mark, for example, is, was part of our team, is a small contractor, and he would like to get to the point more easily. Et euh, pour le dire en français, il veut simplement enlever tout ce blabla de ce cahier de charge and get to the point. Consolinga will solve that issue. On the other hand, we had Tim in our team and Bart also for the BBVR. They would like to guide the constructors towards the specific sections in their technical specification sheets. Consolinga can solve that issue. And for myself, at basics, I would like to support my uh, colleagues so that they uh, can process automatically the request for design inter inter uh, interventions. But it's clear that we have a wide range of possible solutions, so how do we tackle this? Because we need a flexible solution. And that's what we do with our platform. We build a core thing uh, processing the NLP uh, model that will become more and more uh, performant if we train more construction uh, techs. And on top of that, we build blocks, which meet the specific requirements of our clients. The idea behind the blocks is that we actually can reuse uh, the general effort. So, what do you think, Anne? Have we provided some value for you? Well, the question is, am I as Renson or as Renson employee a customer, or am I the co-founder of um, consuming that? Okay, let's uh, make the jump together and uh, see what it gives. Let's do this. From the jury, who wants to start? And maybe I forgot the introduction of the jury. You can introduce yourself <laughs> in 15 seconds. Yeah. So my name is Sebastian. I work for Innovis, a Brussels-based funding agency. So uh, our mission is to fund the innovation within the Brussels-based companies. Uh, my question is, what are the plans uh, after this hackathon for you? So we have thought about that. Um, I think we need the same diversity we had in the team now. It really is a an, yeah. an asset to have both construction 
and software and AI in the same team, but we will need support on additional machine learning and software developers for sure. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Pass on. In order to train your, your NLP uh, module, uh, do you rely on uh, standardized specifications? Do you think about that? How do you uh, go to a very atomic level of specifications in order to be, to be able to determine which type of uh, product is required, uh, which type of technology is required? Well, actually, now there is no standardization in a specification sheet. It can be it can be of any form. In the future, maybe there will be. Let's hope for it. But even if there's some kind of so for standardization in the specification sheets, still this tool is very useful. For instance, in the ransom case, where I use it, uh, or I'm searching for specific um, solutions for ransom. So um, we have thought of this uh, as well. I guess. Okay. Cool. Johan. You also present yourself in okay. 10 seconds. I'm sorry, Johan Winkel, like Friday evening, we don't try, I'm not late, you know. <laughs> uh, just a question on the summarizing. Are you um, summarizing then the specifications which are in the document you have been consulting in a way that I can easily check myself what has been uh, found in the document and at what place? Yeah, for me it was hard to read it because I'm not speaking the language. Um, but it's basically summarizing the most important points that are um, relevant to find a solution in, by at ransom that can work for this uh, specification sheet. And then it just says we can deliver this or we can't deliver this. So that was the check marks or the X's. So it was only check marks. So everything is all right. Um, yeah. So this is a basic solution. But for instance, if the client of Consulenga um, is Mark, then he, he has other needs. So then he has to uh, use another building block that he can. He wants to get rid of the blah blah blah. So he says, "I just want a, a summary of the specification sheet." So depending on the use case, it's another um, summary you get. But the goal is indeed to get summarized in this uh, large um, pages of these numbers pages. Um, what's the exact business model of it? So the client is paying for like per request, or or how is it exactly? Uh... So. That was presented in the last slide. It's um, the idea to have a general fee for the platform, but also on top of that, you have the monthly fee for the blocks. And of course, if we need to develop new blocks, you will also pay a kind of fee for that. And But afterwards, we can see how that continues. If other people start to use that, you can get a piece of that. You see, it's all about the collaboration. Um, yeah, you can think of it like an app store where also other companies can develop something and add it to this. So also we can make revenue from it and the um, audience is, is, is growing. So you have more <coughs> things that you can use. Cool. Last question? Or that was the last question? Anyone in the audience? If there's no more questions, then thank you very much. So hi everybody, so now we're going to present you our Dewey solution, but first, what do we do? Woo! Come on! So we're going to go deep into uh, James and Olivia's family. So they're a normal family living in a house, but it's a special house in one way because as they want to uh, go deeper into uh, greening, uh, green uh, innovation, they install solar panels on the roof. But for all this energy stuff, you receive a lot of bills, a lot and a lot of bills. And uh, at one point, you need to pay for all the energy you put back on the grid. And that's a really painful uh, thing because when you uh, invest in uh, solar panels, you expect it to save money because you produce money. But now you have to pay it to, pay to put the, the energy that you don't use on the grid. So that's really a problem. And we want to help on this. So, as you can see here on the curve, you have the regular cost consumption uh, in grey and the solar production. So, the regular consumption have two uh, main peaks: one in the morning and another one uh, in the evening. But the problem is, how can we shift this so this problem here from under the curve to maximize the production? of the, the self-consumption 
of the of the house. So we can use all the flexibility available within the house, but those objects has to be connected. We can uh, one of the main uh, topic will be heating, but we can also use different appliances such as washing or pools or whatever. Here it's the same simulation that we did uh, from the previous house, and we shifted only the heating system to fit the, the, the production curve. <coughs> because heating is, uh, could represent on Belgian houses up to 60% of the electrical consumption. It's a major shift that we are providing to the consumer. Uh, to the consumer. Because here we can provide uh, up to 20% savings on their bill, 15 from flexibility by providing the best offer at the best, uh, at the best moment, and 5% uh, in gaining in efficiency. Um, the cashback and the model is that we give the back to the customer 15% as a savings and we take a fee on the operations. How do we do that? So first, we provide the best energy services for the need. <coughs> Compa uh, with competing offers from Experiris, uh, Luminous and Echo. Uh, we provide the best IoT offers. Because every household is different. Maybe they already have uh, some items available. And we provide also the service and the maintenance around it. Because sometimes it could be a hassle to install, to power, to, uh, to power meter, and to manage all, uh, at, uh, all at once. So, exactly for uh, James and Olivia, how is it going to work? Um, first of all, they will select their criteria, which household appliances they want to connect. Or do they want to focus more on green energy, more on cheap? Then we come to install uh, the whole installation and adjust the comfort settings. For example, temperature ranges, etc. Um, and then after that, it's just as usual. Um, they can relax, they have the same comfort level or even better as before. They enjoy free maintenance. Uh, and they will, see, they will see the result at the end on their bill, at the end of the year. And James and Olivia are not the only ones. If you're looking to trends, more and more people want to invest in solar panels, and more and more people will have the same needs um, that we uh, would offer. To summarize, we provide comfort as a service. You don't have uh, you don't need to know exactly how much power you need to have a certain level, uh, certain level of comfort. Then we try to do it as green as possible. And then we will try to, depending on your uh, concerns, to make, it, to make it as cheap as possible. But all of that, we will try to make it as simple as possible. Thank you very much. Cool! Welcome to our team. It's called the uh, Site Banner. And uh, we figured out that this industry, the construction industry, has a huge problem. Um, and regarding um, failure in planning or scheduling. We also saw that here in Brussel with the Manhattan Center. It's a 40 million project of uh, basics. And it got a two month delay just because there were some stairs which weren't approved on the right time and in the end they could just not install it. And uh, this is not a single case. 10 to 15 percent of the average costs of uh, projects are just due to this planning failures. We wanted to know if this is bothering real people, really people who are out there. We asked 30 people, uh, by the way, five from Essex, and 97% uh, said that they had uh, planning problems and at least one in the last year. And 76% say that it's really frustrating. 73 people say, 73% uh, say that um, temporary and unpredicted incidents have a huge impact on business results. And for us, what was the most interesting is are they interested in a solution which could face these problems regarding planning or scheduling. And 76% said they are interested or highly interested. 
Hello, this is the this is our solution. It's a wonderful uh, software uh, module that you can uh, use in your BIM models. It's called Site Planner. It's a plugin. And the, if the site manager of the, of the Manhattan Project would have used our software, he would have seen that uh, in week 43 in the project, the stairs would cause a problem. This is a, like a traditional Gantt chart, which is quite abstract. But uh, the Gantt chart, in our version, would also represent the BIM model and the, the, the stage of the, the construction site at that moment. Uh, it would locate the stairs. And our engine the kind of, uh, uh, would uh, check um, in the planning if all the people, machines, and building elements can get at the right location at the right time. And if it's, uh, it's not, it will detect the conflict and make a suggestion. This is the, the desktop version, which is for the site manager. He kind of uh, has a control over it. But after that, he kind of he will uh, share it uh, with mobile application with all the other building parts. How the software kind of works, it's uh, today the, you will provide us with your BIM model, uh, your technical specifications. Uh, based on these two, we would provide, build up a, a basic Gantt chart. This Gantt chart would be reviewed by the site manager. Um, he would also add some temporary elements. Um, today on the, on the construction plans, engineers and architects don't draw construction cranes and, and machines on their plans, they draw the final stage, but also these elements, these temporary elements cause problems uh, in the logistics of the building, of the construction. So you would add these elements, these elements we would provide with uh, uh, library elements, uh, first a few, over time this library would grow and be, be added further. And the, now this is done um, semi-automatically. Uh, the site manager would uh, do the uh, part of the job, but over time the software would improve and would kind of uh, optimize this whole process. This is our value proposition. We have a wonderful software package. For the people in the room, this would cost you, the site managers in the room, this would cost you 499 euros per project per month. You can have as many users as you want. And yeah, prices will go up if you don't sign up today. <laughs> <laughs> Based on this, we uh, saw that in, just in Belgium and Germany, which our team is more or less based, uh, there are more or less 45,000 construction projects with a building cost above 1 million euro. They have the kind of complexity that uh, this planning software could be used. This represents a total market value of 260 million euros. And if we would acquire 20% of that market share, it should lead to a yearly annual revenue of uh, 50 million euros for the company. Our key resources, it's a central cloud-based application. So we do not only gather, the, uh, process the information of your site, but we uh, also learn from all the other uh, sites that use the software. And over time, uh, the, the, the software engine can learn from it and optimize the, the planning. It's also compatible with all the BIM software. It's like it's a plugin, so we have a sales platform through existing software. And uh, it's cloud-based. It's also uh, in the future. It's, uh, it's more easy to integrate new uh, sources of data, like digital print technology and traffic information that could kind of uh, Prefer to use to optimize the software more. So yeah, thank you, Alard. Uh, you see, it's a real problem outside there, and I'm asking you uh, to bring this a step further. And um, yeah, let's just put an end to scheduling failures, and in the end, just relax. Cool. Thank you. So when they say prices go up, they really mean it. I saw the test presentation this morning, and then it was only 300 euros a month. So now it's only 500. So please sign up quickly. So we thought, yeah, okay. yeah, I, I should always be fine. <laughs> but happy that basics with a delay project could be inspiring. Uh, okay, questions? <coughs> what about sustainability? <laughs> Actually, we were thinking like for. Um, uh, for uh, circular construction in the future, um, it, this, the, the program could actually also be reversed. 
And instead of being a planning software for construction, it would be a planning software for demolition. And furthermore, also, if you save time, you save energy, and also waste of materials. Mm. Cool. Um, did you do some market study? I think there's uh, already some software on the market. Uh, this is the fourth dimension of BIM. Yeah. Uh, adding planning to, uh, to your BIM model, so there's already some software there. What's your unique sign point? Uh, um, where do you differ from others? We differ that we kind of, the, the engine uh, really tracks if there is a conflict. So geometrically, we check can I get all the elements uh, in place at the right time. Is the, you have these stairs. Do I have an opening that it fits through? Do you have the right machines that carry it? And also, uh, we could further kind of uh, made a prediction where the materials on the site would be stored and how the most optimal routes um, to get the materials in the our different team. It's not just building the, the, the BIM model or the house, it's uh, more about how everything around this uh, to construct the whole building is managed. I think it's a great easy to have this machinery also involved in that, but isn't that a lot of work to have introduced this by, by the planner? Do we have enough models of all these engines to do that from capacity or how do you deal with that? You have not only to interact, with, I feel, with the big world, but also with the machine producers and things like that. Yeah, from the technical side, it's like we have to build up a library, but um, all the machines which are coming in, they are stored in this library, and then we know the specifications, the movement and stuff. The same with the material, with um, BIM, a lot of stuff is already there online, and the BIM catalogs, open standards and stuff, and um, yeah, it's uh, getting further, and um, we can take this stuff and uh, implement it. And it's kind of like big data combining with um, yeah, you know, like a un like Unity, a gaming engine for simulation. Also, we could like uh, collaborate with uh, manufacturers of these machines, and kind of for them it would also be a uh, added value if they have their uh, models in, in available in space. So. Other questions? Everybody talks about AI. Do you plan to implement something? Because I think that there are possibilities to make your system learn something. As we mentioned, yeah, um, it's just we have this centralized uh, um, yeah, structure design of the application. So we are not just getting um, data from one uh, from one customer. We want to gather all the data, and then we can optimize it, and we can also make suggestions in the in the future how uh, circulations and f uh, process flows should be. And the optimization. Yeah. Next to do, yeah, we took an approach, the first step is, is semi-automated. Of course. And over time, we get more data. It's more a question about the future. Yeah. Question for the audience? Yeah. Go ahead. A uh, small question related to the data and the thing you would like to learn, because I know another <laughs> company was doing a bit the same and they said they had a very hard time and collecting data from existing projects is a complete mess, it's not standardized, it's not, it's stored somewhere at the local PC, but it's not closed, so have you thought about that or it's more something you would uh, solve by creating the data yourself over the course of time? Yeah, that's why we are not trying to do it uh, from an initial state, I think uh, that's not really um, practical, but uh, yeah, as uh, Alard said, we want to do it as a semi, um, semi uh, initial phase, and then we can learn from the inputs of the site manager. Also, by making it social with the mobile mobile application, if other partners in the building industry will give feedback, <coughs> kind of, might uh, generate more data to make it uh, more more intelligent. Faster. All right, sounds really cool. Thank you very much. So good afternoon. Uh, we want to talk to you about. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> so good afternoon. We want to talk to you about smart buildings in an uh, increasingly smart uh, world. Um, when we talk about a smart building, we should we, sh we should ask ourselves what is a smart building. 
um, retain a smart building uh, it should be able, for example, to tell us when we arrive at the office where the empty flex desks are located, where I can go sit. We also think that um, a smart office could uh, help our cleaning people to tell them where the full bins are, where the coffee cups are located on the desks, uh, and uh, that people forgot to put away to optimize uh, where they go to clean and stuff like that. It could maybe help me locate one of my colleagues at the office during the day when I don't know where he is and I need him and it's not at his desk. Um, but as a company owner, maybe it would be nice if uh, my building could tell me um, where, uh, in what areas of my building the people are happy, where they are not happy, based on uh, looking at them and listening to them. So the scenarios I um, the scenarios I explain you are basically um, pretty common for us as humans, uh, uh, because we and um, why is that? Uh, because we as humans, when we are in a building, uh, we walk around, we look around, and we listen to our environment. And um, today's smart buildings, uh, what we call smart buildings are not able to do to, to solve solutions uh, like that because the, the sensor input levels that we typically have in today's uh, smart buildings are at uh, are not at a level to allow this kind of scenarios although techni technology today exists commonly to solve scenarios like this um, and to prove this to you um, we uh, build a little uh, proof of concept um, over the weekend uh, to to handle the first case I explained, being like discovering uh, uh, desks uh, that are empty in the office. So we built like a smart device a bit with a, a smart camera, basically with an AI model, which uh, monitors our two uh, desks in our office, it's basically located over there. And um, so the. The smart camera will discover people coming in, this discovery will be it our people where the reflect desks are and it will also see if the people is on the desk. Together with that, <coughs> we build a little uh, application. It's like a, a flex desk searcher, for example, who has an inventory of our desks and he has discovered this morning um, that uh, the two seats are empty and now he has discovered that there is somebody sitting and in this case it's Dimitris. Uh, yeah. I don't know what he's doing, <laughs> but yeah, you saw he, 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 he discovered that there's a person sitting there, and he updated in the. Uh, um, and now, after uh, a while later, Bart also came in. He went to sit at his desk. He was not there firstly, and he discovered it by, uh, by himself. Then he updated. Uh, it, it's like an example of what could be doing if the, the building by itself discovers. Um, this kind of, of things. Um, today's um, typical um, building companies and, and, and building management companies and stuff like that, we, we all know, yeah, yes, certainly those people from the industry, you have your typical BIMs where you define buildings and stuff like that. Uh, that's be often before you build and during build. Uh, you have your building management system afterwards where everything is managed and handled for the building. And today, a lot of innovation takes place in setting up the digital twin scenario for your buildings. Digital twin will enable, uh, it will collect data to them and will, through the twin, also enable new applications, new services you could provide to the users of your, your buildings or to the owners to to allow them to, 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 to have new, new revenue for, for you, but also have comfort services and added services for the users of your buildings. Um, so we, uh, in over the weekend, thought about to be able to build better applications, we need better data, so we need better sensors, and, and how do we, are we gonna do that? Uh, and that's, that's where we, so we present to you uh, Athena. Athena is a platform we want to build that, uh, integrates into your uh, existing models uh, so it's not replace your existing twin or something it's just a source you put together and it 
It will provide data to your twin, to your existing scenarios. If you don't yet have a twin, you could use it as a basis to start building your own twin on top of that. Um, so what um, what is that? Uh, Athena basically will add to your building the eyes and the ears that we as a human have, and today your buildings have not. Uh, we will do this by um, building a software platform that consists uh, in combination with some smart sensors. Smart sensors that, uh, uh, as a commodity, give you all the data you have today, like humidity, temperature, stuff like that. It also includes vision and, uh, and sound. And through uh, the addition of a number of uh, AI models, will uh, give discoverability in either the video stream or in the other stream to discover information from your building uh, at real time, let's say. We will store the data and through the service layer we will uh, dispatch the data to whatever systems, either your twin or applications you put on top of that uh, uh, platform. Um, so this is basically the solution. So, um, how are we going to build it or, and, and operate it? So basically, I've calculated over the weekend to build a scenario like this. Uh, we would need an, an, an investment like for, for half a million euros. Um, what will that investment will give us? Um, the platform by itself. It will give us uh, four development of four AI models specific to discover certain things in the in the building. And it will uh, design and develop the first uh, smart device, which, which, which will give us the, the video feed and the audio feed and the ability to, to analyze it. An initial batch of 2,000 uh, devices. Yeah. We want to sell uh, services through a subscription based model where we charge like 25 euros per device per month. Uh, and that can run a number of uh, models on it to, to discover a number of information from where they are located. Yeah. Um, initial sales, we thought we would do it through the building companies or the project developers. Like for, we first, first focus on the new market, because there um, they already have for some, a number of these appliances, they have already budget, so it's maybe increasing the budget a bit, but it's less expensive than doing it replacing an existing building. It's a different kind of model to to, to make it happen. The operation cost to make a platform uh, running daily like this, it could, uh, would be like 25k a month. So and if you combine all these things um, in our calculations, we came that uh, to make this uh, uh, beneficial platform, we need like uh, 50,000 square meters managed space a year. Uh, no, managed space, managed space. Uh, and then we talk to people from basics, and we, we would, because we, we wouldn't know it up front 50,000 square meters is that a lot of not. And they say, no, it's one project for us, for us if it's uh, one of the bigger ones, or like five average ones. And so we thought it's probably feasible uh, to be done it. It's commercially viable, especially because it's potential also a global solution. It's not only limited to Belgium, it's something you can sell everywhere in the world where they build stuff like that and operate buildings and stuff like that. Voilà. Cool, thank you. Slicing over time, but not really a problem. Thank you. Questions, go on. Eerlijk, we asked the, the, the church to, to ring a bell, but it was five minutes. So that was like perfect. <laughs> Johan has a question. Yeah, I was thinking how oh, you would do the localization of the people, but then I saw you uh, working with the uh, videos and stuff. That involves uh, some privacy problems. This is my first one. And, the, and the, the second one is uh, you were mentioning uh, 25 kilos a month for um, operations, so it's a uh, thousand euro a day. What, what is in this operation that makes so costly? Yeah, so basically, uh, I answer on a few more. Basically, um, the privacy, we, de we deliberately left it out because it would uh, four or five minutes, even, so we said they would ask about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the privacy issue, because what we're telling the smart device is, um, in IoT terms, it's like we consider to build like an edge device. 
The next device is basically a sensor that has compute logic, it's like it has a computer embedded. So the AI models who do, do the discovery of the video streams and the audio streams will run on the devices, so not centrally. So we're not going to move the, the video streams and the audio streams out of the device towards a central place. It's only the data we discover inside and the things that we do. So it's from, from video or audio uh, point of view, uh, it's already a much less uh, uh, risk. And, and the fact that the, the, the people's data is probably not uh, then you make sure that you design the right models to avoid like, um, stuff like that. They will fix it! Cool! Uh, uh, <laughs> Second question. Ah, the question. Yeah, the question. 25,000. 25,000 is built on. Um, first, you have your the backend. Because it's a cloud-based uh, thing, you need your cloud environment. You need to pay for your cl cloud environment. It's, uh, it's, uh, for a platform like this, it's few, probably a few thousand euros a month. Yeah, and then uh, as a platform, you should provide services. We need probably a few people, like for support people and access people. It's like an, an average uh, on a few of these to make sure that um, you have to make it happen every day. That's basically the basis of the cost. Yeah? It's built on a number of assumptions. It might be slightly wrong or higher or lower, but probably high. But, uh, the, but it's, it's to have an estimate, it's, it's to have a large uh, number, uh, an estimation of the growth of the of the of the, of the costs. Let's see. Yeah. Top, Christophe. Who is uh, who is your customer in this model? Is it the maintenance company that is uh, the one who owns the, the building? <coughs> Um, what's the value for him? Um, depends. It can be different. You could, uh, it could be that the intermediate person offers it as a service. So you, you, you build the cameras, you run the models to extract data. That data is offered. Basically, the value is to all these applications on top that you start building that need the information to be able to provide certain services. So it's probably. Um, uh, a model where also these providers will pay partly uh, as an as a taking of the price for the for the cameras and the models to be able because they need it as a source to be able to provide. Uh, and it depends if you're going to do it directly with them or if uh, like maybe a construction company who wants to build digital twin and wants to look for long term having uh, revenue from from project instead of it's done once it's delivered. Uh, to maybe have a deal with the platform and build their own products so that they can sell them as an added value to, to the long term to, to, to the people buying the company. So, there's multiple options I give. Okay, yeah. suppose I'm basic and I have a 50,000 50, square meter office building. What would this in total cost me per month? Um, Yeah, the, 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 the 25,000 operational plus the 25 per device and it's 2,000 devices in the same building, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's like 75. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. Other question? I think that's the last one. Last but one. Sustainability. Sustainability. Just a one word question. Can you give a, also a short answer to that? It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> The data that you, the information you get out, you can use to build solutions that enable sustainability. For example, you could have uh, um, energy reduction. Yeah, energy reduction, uh, lights, stuff like that. You could. Um, we were thinking, but we limited it to video now. But you could extend it with, with also measuring energy and then decide on switching on and off stuff based on. Because with, with the thing you could discover in a room, there are no people. Because you know, because you discover there are people or not, yeah. you, and you could use that data in an application to steer your HVAC systems or or optimize your. Uh, you could you could also measure temperature in a room, and over time um, have an AI model that learns that in this room, if there are six people on average, based on, on experience, you know, if, if you put an additional person in this room, it makes the temperature grow for a certain amount. Mm -hmm. So if you know the based on the calendar data. It's like a meeting two hours with six people. We can lower the temperature so that the people will compensate 
Yeah. And, and, and yeah. That, that kind of scenario is you would be able to. Yeah. Open uh, air vents for air. To reduce the size of the offices, if you manage the flex space, uh, it, could, it could be it could be it uh, could, more could be an optimization. Space, yeah. Could be an optimization. Yeah. If today did in companies they have an over uh, production of seats because people don't find them or stuff like that. If they, if they can optimize that, might be that they can reduce number. But yeah, there is you have plenty of ideas you can come up to. If you have the data, what you can. So we want to give the data, and then we have creativity of, of start thinking in whatever area, optimizing scenarios and having yeah. the services and so to, to even determine who's working and not or not. Yeah. In function of the that's the first application we do privacy questions. Now we have like the, the last question. Yeah. Three. Okay. Last question, maybe to uh, the other team members. Um, did you measure the interest on Buffalo, and what were the results? Yeah. It could be yes or no. No, no, no. 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 Is not, uh, because we focus on the B two B market, and like hopefully it's more B two C. So True, hard to really, uh, but many people work in offices and will use it as well. Okay, that is like a remark. All the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All. frustration, and in some cases, even death. Yes, I hear it. What? Commute. Commute. Yes, your traffic commute. Um, in extreme cases, some people in the U.S. had extreme road rage and decided to kill another human being. So, This is traffic. You're all familiar. I'm also going to include some familiar faces for you. Um, so we all know about this. So exposure to traffic congestion correlates with reduced time spent with family, stress, death, first countries with ridiculously lax gun laws like mine. Um, people are not satisfied with current traffic control in Belgium, which is not a surprise. Uh, we also found out that people spend about 45 minutes on the road in traffic, and this is in addition to their regularly scheduled commute. So 45 minutes every day. 195 hours a year, equivalent to eight days of sitting in traffic. That's a nice vacation in Hawaii, right? <laughs> that was last year, maybe? Um, driving is also ruining your life by uh, physical means. So sedentary behavior such as sitting in traffic increases chronic disease and negative impacts on your spine. Uh, now that you... Oh, and of course the environment. Exposure to traffic congestion correlates with reduce. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the environment pollution, uh, impending doom of uh, climate change. So, let's imagine that you are in this lane, and you see this free space here. Your thoughts? I want to be on the other side. I want to be on the other side. <laughs> yes. You. You want to be there. Uh, that's nice. If we could remove this uh, median and replace it over here so we can have an extra lane. Uh, this has been done in the US. Um, you can see it's a, a movable median. But I'm wondering if there's a better way. Um, so let me ask you, Kevin, is there a dynamic real-time traffic control service built to adapt to anticipate conditions of congestion? Uh, yes. Maybe? Yes. Yeah? We, we have an idea. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you hear me clear enough. Um, so, um, yeah. so one of the ideas is, as you saw from that uh, video, uh, there is a truck driving through it. Now, pay attention to the 20 times speed, okay? So this is not real time. Uh, but so we think like that. We can speed that up and we can make it in a different way uh, by this example that we built with our two other fine colleagues that made in CAT a design. And as you can see on the right, uh, there's a hole in the middle where we have some kind of a bot, which is the name of our project, and the lane bot moves us, moves the brick to the other lane, and uh, the bot can help us lift it up from the ground and then moves sideways. So let's show the example. So the CAT design copied it and made an example. As you can see, the colors in the red and green is to uh, fix some kind of concern about when it is moving that uh, cars passing in a live traffic situation 
that uh, there is a danger that there is a movement going on. So we zoom in and we see the bots eh? so to show you a bit what's going on. Um, and as you can see, it's like a snake moving towards the other lane slowly but steadily. But it can do that in parallel. The more bots you have, the more faster you can do that. Uh, and so here we simulate the bots in the middle, you see the movement. Uh, in the future, you could develop it with uh, a, 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 a Skarnir uh, system <laughs> or straight like that. Uh, and then you see the pots moving forward as well. And so it moves a bit sideways, sideways the bot then stops, goes back down, moves laterally. And so the entire structure moves. You see the bots disappearing on the left and moving further. That allows us to scale it. To say like, okay, we don't need to install these bots on all the bricks on the road, but we can scale it and it moves dynamically and depending on the distance and the time that we need it to move quickly, we can add more or less. And that's a development question that needs to be constructed. I have no answer for that clearly today. So that's the concept. And at the end, we have the end result. Uh, here we see uh, some parts, yeah? so we have the bot, we have the hole, it can move from hole to hole underneath. The signaling system, so let's go back, we have the signaling system, each time there is a bot, there is an energy source in the center, there is a connection with an electrode that gives the energy. As this example shows, technology-wise it's possible to print some kind of a laser sign on the road, on the side where it's going to be to inform visually the cars uh, and so that's possible. For the bot itself, uh, we have wheels, we have uh, a lifting capacity or to carry the brick and that's a big question. Can it hold maybe 500 kilos, 600 kilos, how much does a brick weigh? And in fact it's possible. So if we, if we see technology-wise, I don't want to make a commercial for this product, of course, please ignore the name. Uh, there are multiple uh, technologies about that. But here you see it's turning, it's going underneath it, it's lifting it up, it's going from the ground, and now it can drive around. And that's the result. So it's technically feasible. And we can adapt it, and it can hold as a minimum 500 kilos easily. So now, uh, the estimated cost, so just to give you an estimation, uh, for one kilometer of, of wall, uh, if we want to move one kilometer, uh, that would cost, excuse me, <coughs> correct, if we would make a new lane in the future, let's say we want to expand the road from three lanes to four lanes, in total six lanes to eight lanes, now that would cost the double. So for one lane it's between 10 to 50 million euros to build that, so for two lanes that would be double. Now that would be the cost if the government or any uh, private company, like in France, uh, be in charge of the roadways, uh, would be quite an expensive investment. And we think that if the theoretical limit of putting on every brick of one meter length, uh, like a thousand lane bots, because one meter, that would cost us about, with a price tag of 800 euros, we suspect. It would be more or less, maybe a thousand, but I think there are 1.9 bots created every year for those uh, mark, uh, for those warehouse technologies. So the technology is pretty uh, decent to develop. Then we have 800,000 euros. And for one kilometer, of bricks alone, now that's a minor cost, it's 15,000, uh, let's say. That. So the bricks itself cost nothing. Now, why in red the thousand nicks is because we can scale it down. We can maybe do it with 100 bots. And so the price, you can see clearly, a jump tenfold if you like. And, uh, yeah. So the estimated revenue, that's a big question. What if we do this? And if it's ever possible in Belgium, maybe in other countries, so open the ideas of outside this country, uh, is weather data. Imagine that the brick is involved with uh, sensors, where you have weather data that you can sell to other vendors for the smart uh, scene. Priority fee, for example, maybe there are users that are willing to pay for a prior road within a traffic. Other target consumers reduce cost and risk, as you can see on the image. Your imagination will probably do the rest. 
Uh, and then some survey data we have uh, used, Buffalo, which I thank them very much for having access to 100 uh, voters all over Belgium. And they said like 70% of them were really interested in the, in the concept of moving such a middle lane to other lanes in order to improve the, the use of, or the waste of unused space. And so that's my case. And here is just for the show. If you have any questions, uh, please do. This is the end. Thank you for your Thank attention. You. Speaking, speaking, you already used the time for the questions, but I, you had really a wonderful story, so I, I, I let you do that. Any questions? Christophe? Hello, wonderful team. Uh, will it not just make the, the traffic jams broader and shorter? Aha. Because you have the bottlenecks at the, the entrance of the, of the ring of Brussels, etc. Yes. There, there are the bottlenecks, so you well, may have just shorter traffic jams to take as long. I agree. Um, in a sense, we have focused on only a straight line, uh, like a bridge. Of course, there are cities at the end of the day, where you have a lot of highway lanes. Probably there is some investigation in that if speeding up the middle lane uh, does that not cause more delay at the end choke points or the beginning of something. So uh, we have not really um, targeted uh, our analysis time and effort to answer such a question. That's a very uh, smart uh, question to take into account. Next 48 hours. Okay, right, cool. That's all. Well, the system of shifting lanes uh, is seen in North America, for instance, but in Belgium. Uh, we tend to put fixed separation between the traffic directions. So isn't that a hidden cost because you would have to remove first? So in your cost analysis, did you uh, take into account the fact that we should adapt the, 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 the roads themselves before being able to put in place the limbo? I agree with you. So there will be... Not yet. <laughs> so yes, in Belgium there are the traffic lights, the highways, yeah, you have to remove all that, uh, then the bricks. Uh, of course, you win a lane by creating that space, making it available. That will make six lanes, seven lanes. That's already a win. But is the cost interesting enough to even do that? Uh, I have not calculated the cost of that. Uh, I only calculated if you had. Um, you had the funds to make one lane of one kilometer. Uh, it's just an economic uh, balance to see if it's viable or not. Uh, but I'm sorry to not have the correct clearance. All right, thank you very much. So we're four in the team, very diverse team. So, uh, we are going to talk about solar panels, which are often in a difficult, uh, accessible places. Um, and what happens, the industry or even uh, uh, individuals, they buy solar panels in the hope that they will just put it on their roof and it will generate revenues for them and that's it. The money just keeps on flowing in and, and uh, that's it. But in fact, you have to maintain them because otherwise they lose a lot of, of efficiency. And over the years, that's a uh, cost. In the end, it's, it's money you don't earn that you could earn. So um, this is something I experience also. I work for Katuna C, which is a warehouse. Um, they have warehouses all over the world and uh, they are a very big logistical player and we place uh, solar panels over all of our roofs. So this is an issue we definitely have. And the problems we have is like, whatever, it can be birds uh, doing what they do on it. Uh, it can be dust, it can be everything, which lowers the efficiency. And this can go up to 30% uh, efficiency loss you can have on your production, and electrical production. So we, as, uh, sorry, so first maybe the, the market, so the total market we looked at uh, Belgium uh, because here it's, it's in, in increasing quickly, we're a Belgian company, so we focus first on our mother market. So in Belgium we have the total market that we could approach is uh, 29.1 million square meters, um, so that's individuals and also industrials. 
But then the serviceable addressable market, so the market we think we would approach, is only the B2B customers. Because we only want to work on flat roofs, because that's easier, and also uh, it's one contact person you have for a big um, area. So you don't have to go to see Jan, uh, Pierre and Jean and, and for 10 square meters, you know. You go and see one guy and you have straight away 500,000 square meters to um, maintain. So we consider only 40% of the markets, that's 11.6 million square meters. And then we uh, hope that we could get the first 10% in the first year, so that amounts to 1.165 million uh, square meters. So our vision to tackle this issue is uh, that we would install and offer to our uh, customers a monitoring system. We would analyze the data out of the uh, monitoring, and then in a third phase, if necessary, we will maintain it. So how does the monitoring work? Um, so we have IOTs we place on the solar panels and we also have a weather station. This allows us to, in the end, uh, calculate the theoretical value and compare it to the uh, real value. And then we can see if there's an issue. This IOT, of course, as we all know, offers very interesting uh, customer uh, or user-friendly user -friendly, uh, possibilities. So here we have a platform which we would also uh, provide to our customers where you can see the situation today, the, the weather, how much you're producing, and so on and so forth. So it also uh, helps the customer in following up his, uh, his uh, production. As I was saying, um, we as Solar Opt would aggregate all the data from all the, um, the warehouses that, that would follow up, or industry, or our customers. And you would see here, so the blue uh, curve is the theoretical um, production we could get. And underneath we have then the, 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 the what we're really producing. And so we would, as a central, we would check where it is needed, where there is an issue. And if there is an issue, we would send a team over there to, to solve the problem as, as quickly as possible in order to, to uh, have the installation producing again to its optimum. How would we do that? So the maintenance, um, we have uh, this and Arne in our team who have uh, very good contacts with the school in Kortrijk. And um, they would, be able to uh, to the design um, a collaborative robot. So um, we would send people on the on the roofs, and thanks to these collaborative robots, their efficiency is uh, six times higher than people washing it. Because yes, today, how do we do the maintenance of, of roofs? It's very archaic to just send people on the roofs, and they have to clean the um, they have to clean the solar panels. But you have to imagine cleaning a solar panel is like trying to take uh, a bird poo uh, after uh, two weeks that's on your windshield of your car, it's gonna be really hard. So these robots uh, improve the, the, the productivity of our uh, maintenance, so we can go much faster. So the business case, um, we computed the, 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 this for a warehouse of 25,000 square meters. 25,000 square meters, to give you an idea, is more than three football fields, so it's already quite big. There you have 7,000 panels, and we considered that for um, a human, it takes more or less one minute to kill, clean uh, uh, one panel, whereas for a robot, it's six times faster. Um, thanks to the computation, we found that um, the cleaning in the current situation is 15 cents um, per square meter, and we believe that we can uh, lower this by 58% for for, uh, in, in, in uh, our costs. This 58% is not the price we would charge to our customers, this is the business case, but this is the margin we have. So we have this. 58% where we can offer, by instance, 10% compared to the 15 cents per square meters to our customer, and we can then take the 48%. So we didn't yet decide on the, the pricing strategy, but this is the, the margin we have. And then um, we have an assumed total cost. Um, that's for the, um, the sensors, so the IoT system. This is um, also quite costly as, as a first uh, investment, but we believe that it really has an interesting uh, potential for our customers. Why? Because if you lose one panel, they're in series, so you lose many of them. So I imagine that you have a team today of, of cleaners who go on the roof, they clean everything, everything's fine, and the next day you have an issue, then it's, by instance here in this case, 500 panels which fall and do not produce anymore, then you lose it for until the next cleaning, you know? So whereas we can detect it directly, and so our loss will be much less. So over the time, you, you recover the initial cost of, of the monitoring system. So uh, to just wrap it up, in a nutshell, what do we provide? We provide uh, real-time monitoring and anal analysis. 
This uh, allows us to do much faster and efficient cleaning. We also have our systems to clean much faster and therefore we guarantee much more uh, efficiency of the, the, the photovoltaic, photovoltaic installation. Thank you very much. Yeah, the uh, the efficiency gain uh, for the cleaning with the cupboards. Uh, what's the minimal uh, surface? Uh, the assumption about the minimal surface bringing you to the conclusions you you just showed us. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a backup slide indeed. Uh, it was a bit too many figures, but uh, we thought you would be interested. So how do we get to the numbers? Uh, so you have the 15 cents, the current situation on the left, and uh, our solution on the right, where you see the, the end figures we saw before, these two. Um, so your question is uh, our assumptions we made for the calculation, right? Yeah, because breaking a uh, uh, cupboard for uh, 20 square meters doesn't make sense. You need correct. to have several thousand. Yeah, 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 correct, absolutely. Um, so, so the business case here is for 25,000 square meter, that the one we considered. Um, and this is the investment cost. So we would buy uh, three uh, collaborative robots in the first year. We considered it was 10,000 euros per, um, per robot. And, and the research and development needed is 60,000. Um, so it's 90,000 in total. And we believe that in the first year, we can recover it. Okay. How did we do this to include this in the price? Uh, so in this price here, um, we considered uh, 200 days working, so 50 days that we don't have work, and um, yeah, so that's how we, we considered it in, in our case. So if I understand well, the cobots are not staying in place, you will come with the people you install them. Why didn't you consider to have something staying in place, cleaning, because you, you, you will now have a lot of transport in your own. And leads, uh, we would look uh, later on further to check if there is some more automated solutions. But the first idea now is that uh, the human is needed to put the cobalt on, uh, actually, the, the, so to put the robot on one lane of uh, solar panels. He goes, he comes back, and he can. He have, someone has to take it off, put it on, on another lane of uh, solar panels, so he can go again. So for the moment, the solution that we found that is uh, easily or um, quite quick maybe to implement, eh? we still need the human. But indeed in the future we could look further that maybe some other engine stays there and puts from one lane to another lane, but again then we will after some time. We will check with the whole show. Were <laughs> right. these cobots already available or still in the design? Uh, we found some uh, available uh, in Australia, I think. Yeah, in the southeast, but they're not uh, um, stretchable. Stretchable. They're just fixed, uh, one fixed length. So if you have different solar panels and you buy uh, of different corporates, you need more. Other question? Question from the audience. Let's start over there. How is the uh, tracking system where you measure the difference between the relative load? So when you send the robot, you decided based on this tracking thing that you do about how efficient it is. Yeah. So isn't it possible uh, to just consider a windshield cleaner on, on it that is permanently there? And because you don't need a lot of control if you're cleaning it very fast. Mm -hmm. No, we, we thought about this. The issue is it's, it's outside. You have winter time, water, and, and at least in, in, in this country, well, it can, it can freeze, you have issues, um, so, you, so you have problems if you, put, if you conceive a, a system with water. This is something that's not uh, feasible. Also, if you have a solar panel, it's, uh, it's quite a static system. If you start putting movable systems on every solar panel, I think at the end you'll have more problems solving the moving systems than actually the solar panels than actually the initial system. But maybe in the future it's, it's going to be more possible. 20 seconds for the last question. Here. Yeah, you are a jury. So you are. So if I got it, uh, you only will uh, operate when it's needed, no? Yeah. So sure. this is where you have an impact on sustainability. <laughs> 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 <Yahoo>! <laughs>
I like short questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, and uh, I'm sorry, but because of the live demo that we want to do, uh, I will have to project from my uh, project from my phone and then also switch to my phone. And during the switching, I'm said that I'm not allowed to talk, so that's why maybe I will look worried. Anyhow, so no worries, um, please. So we are Numopic. Uh, my name is Philip, and I will start with the building which is uh, which is familiar, I think, to everyone living in Brussels. Uh, and also, I think that you mostly know where I'm going, so if you <laughs> zoom in a little bit onto the building, you will notice that there is something a little bit off. And uh, this, is, uh, this is most likely a mistake during the execution. And uh, these kind of mistakes were happening in the 15th century, but they're also happening today. And everybody working in the building industry knows that mistakes uh, always cost a lot of money. So we took an example of a project, uh, which is uh, probably something like a medium-sized project for basics. So a uh, hotel with 10 floors of 60 million euros. And doing some averaging and uh, read reading some uh, uh, research which is done on this. So the direct cost, so just fixing the mistakes which are made on site, is about 3 million euros. And But there's also all the indirect costs. So lost time and uh, lost productivity, which then amount to actually larger values. There is some current technology used, so uh, on the building site you use tablets with, uh, with the BIM software. Uh, it, there is a use of top topographic devices in order to measure things, in order to try to avoid mistakes, but this is still not sufficient. And our idea is to try to reduce this significantly while just increasing the cost of technology slightly. So we believe that uh, this is something that can make a lot of business sense to uh, big companies. Uh, the concept of it that we developed is actually a VR headset. This is something that we developed over, uh, over the weekend, hacked some things together, just in order to show you how it would work. So it would be a removable headset. Uh, a user on a construction site would not have it all the time on, but it would just use it when the, there was a need for measurement, for uh, getting some BIM information, or for uh, making some notes, uh, small edits on the BIM model and so on. Um, the idea is to mix actually the surrounding of, uh, of a person, so the system would have cameras on the front, and then also to merge basically the BIM model inside uh, the real world, and so this would be then used with the plaster cameras. And we also have an idea of how to make actually very accurate positioning. So we would use ultra wideband sensors, so this is something of this size that is integrated into the into, this, uh, into the helmet, and also there will be anchors positioning all around the building site in order to have very accurate positioning uh, throughout the building. So, because of the system that we use now, uh, we cannot directly show you how it looks like from the, well, this is a working prototype, this is uh, just a physical mock-up, but, so we cannot show you exactly how it looks like from the, from the inside, but, uh, this, so this is not live. Wait. Again, sorry for all the any technical issues that we might have. And okay, so this video is not working, but from the inside you can see actually the <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will not talk now since fixing technical issues. But I will, okay, I will switch to the live demo then, because I cannot show you at the moment how, uh, how this works from the... Uh, we have technical issues. Maybe I will try to show how Okay, so something went wrong. We will we will can you switch to the regular presentation, please? Yes. We didn't touch it up. We have backups, but yeah. Uh, we can show you how it works from the inside of the headset, but the uh, streaming to the to the live demo doesn't. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, yeah. So 
this is how it looks like from the inside of the headset. So this is uh, this headset. Uh, so you can see all the surroundings, but also you can make uh, adjustments. So this is just uh, a thing that you can do inside in order to uh, draw out the space in, inside which one you uh, which you want to work. But then also for the so live demo, this is what we developed as an app. So we built a BIM model of this whole room in Revit, and then we exported it into uh, the app that we have on the on the headset. So you can uh, move around, you can look around, and you can uh, click on. Uh, items in order to get information. The idea is also inside this, so this doesn't, so what we have now on the headset, which you can check out later on, uh, this doesn't have mixing of the real world and the virtual world, this for the moment is only the virtual world. But you can um, you can check how, uh, how it works and how you can uh, interact with the model. So, this is the live-ish demo, uh, which you can check later on, but what we have is also a business model. So we have, the idea is we would like to have um, leasing of the system, so uh, we don't think that it makes sense to sell it. We would like to lease it for uh, the duration of the project, and then for an example for uh, the project that we used before, we would, for 60,000 euros, we would lease the construction site uh, 10 helmets. We would take care of positioning all these anchors that we have, that we have accurate positioning, and we would also then provide the training and all the support that would be needed during, uh, in the duration of this project. And uh, we would start by targeting large projects because we think on large projects the gains can be much, much larger. Um, there is obviously some competition. Uh, for instance, there is a HoloLens from Microsoft, which is uh, obviously a very big player. But uh, I, I believe that the HoloLens has uh, significant problems, uh, mainly because of the technology it uses. So it uses uh, AR, which has a very limited field of view. It's, um, it's a system that you have to wear all the time, and uh, I am aware that sometimes that can provide uh, <coughs> problems with uh, secure, um, yeah, safety on the, on the building site and also comfort. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have uh, options, uh, systems with AR with tablets, but those, of course, having a tablet on the construction site is not the most comfortable thing, and when you have a tablet, you cannot actually use your arm, so there is a significant limitation to this, these systems. We did some financial projections. Uh, we did some financial projections, and um, we would need about six months in order, so we would be basing ourselves on a lot of technologies which are already developed. We would need about six months in order to develop a really uh, proper working prototype, so not something like a mock-up, something that doesn't really work when we want to uh, project it, uh, but something that um, we can get actual funding for, and then probably from, in order to go from prototype to release to manufacturing, so to go to something that is actually manufacturable, we would need another 12 months, and then start selling the, leasing the systems. Um, the next steps uh, is uh, then doing this, and uh, we also have a lot of ideas in order to implement other features, so like implementing infrared cameras, um, using it for very specific cases where the gains would be higher and so on. So this is it. This is uh, the team. Can you come down also? So we were uh, we were seven and we really enjoyed working here uh, over this weekend. So and so thank you very much for the organizers for uh, having this. Any questions? Who wants to start? Johan? Start with uh, Sebastian's question. What about sustainability? No, <laughs> that to be serious. <laughs> that to be serious. You, you have been speaking about anchors, which you need to position. Uh, you've been speaking about ultra wideband. You've been passing very quickly over that. How do you manage this on a construction site? How many cables do you need? How do you work well, it? We would, we would. Sure. So we need ultra wideband. We believe that, so uh, depending on the size of the construction site, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, the amount of uh, anchors could be quite high, so it's, it's possible to have systems with a lot of, uh, a lot of anchors. Um, we would have, so probably we would have to have anchors on every floor in order to uh, deal with the attenuation of the, of the signal. We, the anchors themselves and the markers themselves provide a certain amount of Accuracy. That's a little bit higher than we uh, than I said here. So that would be something on the order of like 10 centimeters, taking into account all the limitations of the yeah how, how far the system uh, the signal can actually reach. But because we have tracking, so inside the headset we have uh, visual tracking because this system has four cameras and we would use a similar system to not exactly this one. 
Uh, it has four cameras, and this does tracking quite precisely, but it does the tracking um, relatively. So if you move from a room to room, you accumulate error, and but it's a very precise tracking. You also have inside the gyroscope and accelerometer. On the other hand, the ultra wideband provides absolute tracking. So we believe that with sensor fusion, we can get to a centimeter accuracy, and we discussed with some experts, uh, so uh, that are actually working with these systems and. Uh, they seem to agree that uh, we could have that accuracy. Next one. What about innovation? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> so we know that innovators can help the companies in the face of prototyping, but we ask some conditions about technical challenges, meaning that you don't make a simple integration of existing building blocks, that you create something. We did the future company or your own company. You know? So how do you see uh, this thing? Well, we believe that the system itself is innovative because all, it's nobody else on the market provides something like this. So we think that using building blocks is an advantage because we can move faster. But nobody of our of the competitors that we found is using ultra wideband in the same way. They're not using um, so we would use virtual reality in a kind of a mixed way. A lot of them are using really AR to project things onto the onto the field of view. We would use it differently. So we would uh, it would not be an immersive system where you would always have it on. Which, as, as far as I'm aware, some people are testing these systems, and there is some comfort problems that when you wear the system all the time on your on your face, and, yeah, people don't want to have that on their face all the time. So I think that the system is innovative. Now that's yeah, some somebody else too should say yeah, it's innovative or not. So we should we should discuss with people in the. I mean, or it's more in the way that how what is the tech barrier you know uh, that you place in front of your competition. Uh, that would be uh, so. There is still the sensor fusion, and there is still the implementing the ultra wideband. So there are still some technical challenges. I don't know if you. So, uh, okay, so okay, for B6 uh, now. So we have a lot of problems on site, and today how we resolve, we resolve them is by using 2D, ta 2D tablets and uh, uh, some measurement tools, which requires a lot of time to put in place, and they are not accurate because, let's say, a laser meter or anything, you have to fix a point on a, let's say, on a wall. That is not. We don't know if that is real to make sure that this uh, the other wall is actually at the right place. So the control measures are not really uh, accurate today. And these 2D, okay, they like cost like for a project of 40 million, they cost around 35,000 euros to implement. If we go to these um, advanced 3D, these would be really like extremely costly. With like we ask for quotations, really costly, and we are like providing something for. 60,000 euros, let's say uh, 1.5 times the 2D solution is really the basic things. Uh, so we are providing something really not expensive, but is highly added value. Just another more thing about the innovation. So uh, a number of us are uh, come from with a, from a research background. And there are definitely some still technical challenges that should be solved. And once you get into, actually, so now we're working on it for 48 hours. Once you get actually into the matter, I, I'm sure that there will be also things that would be patentable and so on. Yeah. Another question? Audience? Hola. Um, I definitely agree that it might be a problem, but I'm not sure it's the right way to solve it. Um, do you know Scaled Robotics? They use actually non-humans to track the site and they also make the link with BIM. So there is no need to, for a human to put the heads on and walk around so you can save on, on humans, I think. And they, yeah, just a question. What's the added value of putting a human? But still on the construction site you will have many humans which will want to know where the where this thing should be, and you also have a lot of humans that maybe you know you have a you have a light and you installed it, and you want to say uh, you want to click on it so that somewhere on the on somebody else's computer it says yeah that that light is installed. We're now at thirty five percent of uh, all the lights installed, or something like that. So if the robots know it, I don't think that it's enough yeah. for uh, that people. You know the yeah. the result what you see is, is exactly that. So you can see what what's tracked on the side. 
but yeah, but just there, the there is a lot of there is a lot of use cases. So, for instance, maybe somebody is uh, placing electricity, and that electrician, uh, you know, just before placing the panel, uh, the, the final panel, wants to take a picture of all the wiring that is inside, so that the next person will will be there. But also, those systems of the robot, I think they're much much more expensive than what we would have as a price. It's, I mean, one like robot walking around, it's hundreds of thousands of euros. Also, ro robots are like really like, okay, they would work very well in a theoretical place, but on site it's a very chaotic place, there is a lot of uh, things right hand up, people uh, moving, so it cannot work actually today. And actually, actually it's, it's, not, uh, it's complementary, these two things. One is an observer. So yes, if the drone technology is on the point, you can have the drones flying around and adding information to your system. But at the end, it's still the human taking decisions. So and when you are <coughs> in the spot and having access to all this information, where you can switch between layers and seeing it really around you, you want to see the electricity, you want to see the heat. It offers so much opportunities to have this platform available for the decision maker, which is the human, it's not. Yeah, but that, that, that's what so it's complementary. It's not like uh, it's something that will replace the drone, or the drone replaces it. Something to further discuss during a drink. I think. Thank you.